God. Praise God once again. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Hi, mom. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Dear Lord, we come before you this evening, Lord. We exalt your name, Lord. You're the King of kings. You're the Lord of lords. There's no one like you, Jehovah, O oh Lord. You're worth your all the praise. You're worth your all the honor, O oh Lord. Lord, even as we begin this time right of now, fellowship, this Lord, God, this time as we fellowship in your presence, O oh Lord, Lord, take over, O oh Lord, cover us with the blood of Jesus, O oh Lord. I avail myself as a vessel, Lord, minister through me, O oh Lord. Speak to us, O oh Lord. Take over this life, take over our pa, our devices. I come against any distractions, any attacks of the enemy. I cancel them in the name of Jesus, Lord. I pray that you may speak through me, Lord, that you may minister to our hearts, O Lord, and that you may be with us, O Lord. Lord, I thank you and I glorify your name. You're the King of Kings, you're the Lord of Lords, O Lord. Lord, we thank you and we lift your name on high for all that you may not have prayed for, Lord. I pray that the Holy Spirit may intercede in jesus name we pray amen amen i want us just to soak into this instrumental just listen to it use it to use it to meditate just take some time and thank god for the father that he has brought you for everything that he's given unto you just tell him thank you tell him thank you Right now, just hearing God tell me, he said, you were created to worship him. Somebody write this, type, I am created to worship God. That's what I'm hearing. Type this, this is your personalizing it. I am created to worship God. I am created to worship 
God. This is why he created you, so you can worship him. So God created you to worship him. So if you're not worshiping God, what are you doing? He said, you were created. He said, you were created to worship me. That's what he was saying. So you that is listening, type it, Lord, I am created to worship you. I know this. That's why every day you have to worship. Wherever you are, as you are playing this, just speak in tongues. Get lost in God's presence. I feel the presence of God so strong. Like I want to just, I don't know, it's like I don't know what to do right now. It's, it's just like heaven. God likes the sound. He gave me the sound. Just pray the Holy Ghost receive new tongues in the name of Jesus. For those that don't speak in talk, receive the gift right now. In the name of Jesus. Oh my God. I feel the presence of God. So strong. He said you were created to worship him. So worship your father right now. Oh my God. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for your love. That unconditional love that you cannot get anywhere. We thank you for Lord, your worth, you hold the praise, you are protector, you are 
defend ahera so paha a provider he saru abaha our companion here as kapa our friend haresa kopa teraba ana mane na maya na yana ala kela so kapa teleka tamana yana ya ala kena mana sela kama ni na maya given unto you, for the father that has brought you, for the battles that he's fought for you without your knowledge, for your for the protection that is given unto you, the provision that is given unto you. Just tell him thank you. Just tell him thank you. Oh, hey. Ana la le kapata le aya O yawe 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 Praise God. <laughs> Praise God once again. I don't know, I'm just in the mood of thanksgiving and gratefulness for what God has done for me. And this morning, at around, I think, 2, 2 in the morning or at night, depending on how you view it, I was just thinking about how far God has brought me, all the battles that he's fought, not just for me, but for me and my family. 
all the enemies that God has helped us fight without even our knowledge. And the more I thought about it, the more I couldn't help but get emotional. And I was just I was just grateful to God for all that is done for me and my family, my my friends, my loved ones. Basically the far that God has brought me is a testimony. And I don't know how many of you how many times you just take time to go and sit in God's presence and think about what he's done for you. When you think about it the battles that he's fought for you are even the, the ones he's fought for you without your knowledge are even more because often we don't see what God is doing in our lives until later on when things start to unfold and you realize what God has been protecting you from the battles that he's fought for you how he's been providing for you how he's preserved your life so many times I don't know, I've, I've, a certain memory has just come to mind at this moment. A couple of years back, I don't even know where this, it's such a long time since I thought about it. A couple of years back, I was going through a lot, a lot of afflictions, a lot of spiritual attacks, witchcraft attacks. And it was getting to me, it was too much. But despite all that I was going through, I was just trying to get by to the best of my ability. And now that I think about it, I realize that was God helping me, strengthening me, keeping me company, giving me rest, even in the most unlikely situations. So I've just remembered an incident. This is even beyond the spiritual attacks. But when you think about it, everything that you go through, all the battles that you go through are spiritual. Because as I've, to, I've, to, I've talked about before, when you read in the book of Ephesians chapter 6 verse 18, you see that all the battles, that the things that we are fighting against are not even physical. We are fighting against spiritual forces. When you read uh, verse 12, sorry, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, it says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So this scripture just shows that all the battles you're going through, all the, 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 the battles that, that are manifesting physically, it begins in the spirit. That's why it says that whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. This means that whatever reflects physically has first started in the spirit. It, it began in the spirit before it, it began, it manifested physically. So all those battles that you're facing, maybe disputes, disagreements with your loved ones, your husband, your wife, your children, it's the devil at work with his agents, the devil planting seeds of disunity, the devil planting seeds of anger, jealousy, all these things, the, the sicknesses that are not ending, constantly going to hospital all the time, your money is just being wasted in hospital. Those are spiritual attacks, but they are manifesting physically and they can be explained scientifically. That's why a lot of people don't believe in this spiritual realm and, and forces because all this, because God in all his wisdom and knowledge, he gave us human beings, the knowledge, the brilliance, he's given the doctors, the scientists, the ability to, to, to identify the, the physical explanations for what, what is going on. But what we don't, what, what most people don't know is that this thing, it, it begins in the spirit. That's why you find that a lot of people come and fight and say that there's no God, that everything can be explained by, the, by science. There are a lot of explanations for it. But what people don't know is that these things begin in the spirit. The battles that we're waging, we're, the, the battles we're facing, they begin in the spirit. And that's why you cannot fight these things on your own. You need God. You need the power of God. Only God can be able to help you overcome these spiritual battles. That's why you find that these, these curses, 
they recur from generation to generation sicknesses you find like one family your family maybe there's an issue of high blood pressure it started with your father your great grandfather it goes on to your children cases of diabetes cases of of people not getting married in the family barrenness in the family these are not these are this cannot be explained physically they cannot be explained by science these are things that happen in the spirit curses either words that have been spoken against you altars that have been planted against you but through it all god has been preserving your life he's been protecting you so all the time whenever you sit you sit back at the end of the day or in the morning just take time and think about how far god has brought you this is not something that you take lightly this is not something that you just think that oh i'm alive because I, I, there's no God, I'm just alive because of luck, I'm just alive because of this and this. That's a deception of the enemy, trying to make you think that you can explain everything, that everything can be explained, that you know everything. Or that you don't need to know these things, that you don't need to pray, that you don't need to seek God. But over the years, I've realized the importance of seeking God because during those moments that I used to fight those spiritual battles, being afflicted, collapsing on the street, getting sick, trying to commit suicide, harming myself, all those days, all those years of frustration and pain, even being admitted to mental hospitals because they thought it was a problem with my mind. Through it all, God protected me and preserved my life. So I'm here to tell you that the fact that you're alive is not because of your own doing, but it's because of the grace of God. It's because you, God still has a purpose in your life. God still has a plan for you. There's a reason he brought you to this world. It may not be clear right now. You may be going through a lot of hardship, a lot of problems, but there's a reason. You did not just come to this world randomly. You're not alive till this day randomly. God has a plan for your life. And through you, God will draw people to him. People's lives will be changed. You might think you don't have an influence or maybe you, you're all, all the influence that you have is negative right now for the people around you. But God has a great purpose for you. Look at me. I never imagined in my wildest imagination that I would one day be preaching online. In fact, I, I, I do not like attracting attention to myself. I like before I used to live a life of solitude. I didn't like to interact with people a lot because of all the things that I was going through. And it was just my it's just my nature. I'm not I'm not one to like to attract a lot of attention. So for when God told me to come and preach online, I thought it was a joke. I thought God was joking. In fact, I thought it was man manipulation that the devil was messing with my mind. Only for God to keep on confirming and confirming and convicting in my heart that I need to come and preach. I need to come and tell my story so that someone else can be saved, so that someone can find hope. Someone can see that if I'm alive today, if God preserved my life, he can also do the same for you. So I don't know who you are. I don't even know how I've, I've, I've headed in this direction because it all began when I remembered an incident. I've not yet spoken about it yet, but it was around, I think, 10 years ago, if I'm not wrong, I just began going through all those problems. I couldn't go anywhere alone. So at that point, I think we were going somewhere with my uncle, one of my uncle, my, my mom's brother. And the place that we live in, the highway, it's very dangerous. The road is quite dangerous because a lot of cars, it has a, lot, a traffic of a lot of cars. So one day we were just crossing the road with my uncle. We were headed somewhere. I think we were heading to, to town but we decided to use an alternative route and we had to cross that highway that day there was the bridge was not people didn't used to like using the bridge a lot because it seemed easier to just cross it without using the bridge so as we were crossing the road we crossed it's a it's a dual it's a dual highway so you have to cross two 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 tarmac roads before you get to the other side of the road so we crossed one of them, everything was okay. And then we crossed the second, as we were just about to cross the second part, the cars were so many. But somehow it's like, I didn't realize that the car, I miscalculated, I saw as though the car, one of the cars was a bit far away. 
So I, I just stepped out, me and another guy. You know the way you before you cross the road, there are a lot of there actually a couple of you lining up to wait for the cars to pass. So I stepped out and I don't remember if I'm the one who stepped out first or if it was, it was this other guy first, but we both stepped out. But somehow my uncle noticed the danger and he pulled me back. He pulled my, my coat back, the coat that I was wearing. And immediately he pulled me back. A car came and hit the guy that was next to me. I'm telling you, I've never seen such a... It was, it was not a good thing to, to witness, but the guy was thrown up into the air and thrown up and into the center of the road. It was so traumatizing to watch that for a moment, I, for a few moments, I couldn't stand. I, I couldn't do anything. I was basically paralyzed in fear. I was just like this, shaking in fear because I knew that would have been me. Since I was the one who was ahead of the guy, he was on this side, on my right side, and I was, I was on this side. So I would have been the one who, have, who had received the impact first before it got, the car got to him. Unfortunately, the guy did not make it. People started coming around, the, ambul the ambulance came. By the time the ambulance came, the guy was gone. That's how he went. I don't know why this memory has just come back to my mind, but I believe that is God showing me that one of the ways, the many times that he protected me. This is even beyond me trying to take my own life. At that time, I had I had recovered. I had stopped trying to commit suicide. Actually, I, I think I'd, I don't remember clear, clearly whether I had stopped or not, but I usually I used to have spells of where I would, I would, I, I was under a lot of medication, a lot of medi anxiety medication, depression, depression medication. So I don't remember very well whether I, I was still trying to commit suicide or not, but what I remember is that that memory has just come to my mind right now when I've sat here. And that is God telling me, re re reminding me of the countless number of times he's preserved my life. So I don't know about you. Just think, take a moment and think back to the number of times that God has preserved your life, whether to your knowledge or that not to your knowledge. Most times God has preserved our life when we didn't even know about it. And so this memory at that time when that guy died right there in front of me i was traumatized for almost a month every time i would sleep i would keep on remembering how he was thrown into the air and how he died there i would keep on remembering how that would have been me so i just want to tell you that god loves you so much and just the fact that you're alive today, right now, it's because he loves you. I know you're wondering why this topic, the shelter of the Most High. Yesterday, as I was thinking, this morning actually, as I was thinking about what, what God has done for me and the fact that he's brought me and my family, I just had, I had this clearly, Psalms 91. So I was like, okay, because I started getting a bit uh, frustrated. I was thinking about some things, but in the process, I was trying to counter those thoughts with reminding myself where God had brought me from. And that's, a, that's one tactic that you can use whenever the devil tries to bring troubling thoughts to your mind, frustrating thoughts, counter it, speak into, speak it out. Say, devil, I know that God is with me. I know that he's with me because he did this and this for me. He saved me this time. He preserved my life. He protected me. Start speaking it out. And the more you speak it out, you'll find this rest. There'll, there'll be this comfort that will come and settle on you. This comfort that does not make sense. So that's what I was doing. I started getting troubling thoughts and I was troub troubled about some issues that, I, that I've been thinking about lately. And I just started reminding myself, about the, the, the things that God has done for me, the, the things he's done for my family. And in the process, I had clearly Psalms 91. So I was like, thank you, God, let me go and read Psalms 91 because that scripture, it's very common. People know that, most people, most people know that it's a scripture about God's protection. 
and how he preserves he preserves our lives he always he's always there to protect those who love him those who those who always seek his face he rewards them by protecting them giving them a higher level of protection that they could not have got anywhere else so i had some i had clearly psalms 91 and i went to read it when i went to read it three verses stood out this is verse one and it says i'm going to read in the new living translation version it says those who live in the shelter of the most high before i could even go beyond there i, I got stuck on those who live live the word live the word live implies that's where you stay that's where you're always it's basically like your home someone asks you where do you live you'll tell them the place that you live that that means that's the place that you're always that's where everyone can find you in case someone wants to find you that's a place that they can find you that's the first place that they will look for you that's what live in place live in place your home your place of dwelling your place that you that you always you can always be found if you're not somewhere else someone can know that they can find you there so i couldn't move past the word those who live live that's where you stay basically this is not a place that you visit that you come and visit once in a while like a vacation but that's your home such that whenever whatever whatever place you go out there when you come back that's your home so i i that that word leaves stood out for me but i decided to continue reading those who live in the shelter of the most high the shelter this is a covering it's like a covering over your over your head i want you to have this image of a tree when i was thinking about it i was having an image of a tree you know these big trees that have a lot of leaves such that when you're under the tree if someone is on top of if someone is in the air maybe they're, they're on a plane or something and and you're under the tree they cannot see you because the tree has a lot of shade that's the type of image that i was getting when i when i saw the word shelter so it says those who live in the shelter of the most high the most high is god will find rest in the shadow of the almighty will find rest so these three words to doubt live shelter and rest and as i read this i now understood why it's so important to always dwell in the presence of god to live there to stay there to soak in his presence all the time never depart from his presence never let a day go by without you going before god and talking to him praying and pray you don't really have to lock yourself in your in a room all the time to pray to pray because prayer is just talking to god prayer is just talking to god having a conversation with him so you can even be talking to him throughout the day as you and when you're at, at your workplace when you are in your school if you're in school when you're in the street walking even as you're going to work be talking to him telling god i thank you for what you're doing for me god i'm so excited i can't wait to see basically make him your friend because he is your friend and he's the only faithful friend the only true friend who never deserts you who's always there with you no matter what happens so these words these three words stood out those who live in the shelter of the most high will find rest in the shadow of the almighty this was David speaking in this psalm and he said, This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. David was saying that God is his place of safety, that no matter where David goes or used to go, no matter what trouble comes his way, God is his place of safety and he trusts God. Because God always comes through for him. God always protects him. God always preserves his lives. God, God, his life, God always gives him a heads up, a warning if he's supposed to do something or not. This is what it means to trust someone. And then verse 3. I just read only three verses. I read the whole of it, but the three verses are the ones that I, that I, I, I stayed on for so long. It says for he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly from deadly disease he will protect you from every trap he will cover you with his feathers 
He will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Let me continue reading it now that we are here. Do not be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor the arrow that flies in the day. Do not dread the disease that stalks in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Though a thousand fall at your side, though ten thousand are dying around you, these evils will not touch you. Just open your eyes and see how the wicked are punished. If you make the Lord your refuge, look at the condition. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. There's a condition. All these promises, God is so loving and merciful and kind. God is so loving and merciful and kind. He's so loving and merciful and kind. He always, he always protects us even while we are, we are still sinners, even while we are, we are still living in sin and all that. But there's a higher kind of protection. There's a, there's a higher, there are higher benefits that come when you dwell in his presence. It says, if you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. Hmm. It's interesting, this instrumental. It says, no matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. In Jesus, I can make it. It's just a reassurance. God is speaking. God is saying that only in him will you be able to make it. Will you be able to overcome all the traps of the enemy? That's exactly what this chapter is saying. If you make the most, if they make the Lord your refuge, if you make the most high your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. For he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go. They will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. You will trample upon lions and cobras. You will crush fierce lions and serpents under your feet. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. So you see the condition. If you make the Lord your refuge, if you make the Most High your shelter, no evil will conquer you. No plague will come near your home. And even when, if it comes, even if it comes, even if the attacks comes, God will deliver you. God will set you free. God will protect you. But the condition is you have to dwell in his presence. You have to seek his face. You have to live in his presence. This means you don't just go into his presence when you want him to do for you something, which is something that you often do. Human beings, have, 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 they are, we are very forgetful. We forget very quickly what God has done for us. That's why it's always good to remind yourself constantly. Never let a day go by without you reminding yourself where God has brought you from, what he has done for you. Never let a day go by without, without having that heart of gratitude. So this is what God was telling me this morning when I woke. I hadn't even slept. It was late in the late in the in the night. And God was telling me about rest. Rest that can only be found in Him. Rest that can only be found in Him. And this rest is rest that does not make sense. Rest that that hmm. When you go to John chapter 16, John chapter 16, verse 33, the New Living Translation version, it says, I have told you this so that you may have peace in me. 
here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows but take heart because i have overcome the world i have overcome the world there is a certain verse I'm, I'm looking for but god was basically is basically saying that only in him will you find rest only in him will you be free you see in verse 33 of john chapter 16 it says i have told you all this so that you may have peace in me so you see the peace you cannot find it anywhere the world cannot give you this peace that god will give you the world cannot cannot give you peace that it's amazing how just a moment this scripture is coming so strongly i believe i have to say it i have to speak it out This is Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7. The NLT version says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He has done then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. You see the emphasis again, as you live in Christ. So you cannot get this peace outside of Christ. You cannot get this peace anywhere else apart from in Christ. This is the, this is the condition. You will look for this peace you will try to find it in your in your loved one in your husband in your how in your wife in your children in your job that's why you find that people are always struggling so much moving from one maybe for those who are not married moving from one relationship to the other searching for peace searching for love in all the wrong places when god is offering it to us free but somehow the devil deceives us, making us search for it in all the wrong places. Maybe some, some of these people, that's where they find themselves in addictions that they didn't even know how they found themselves in. Some people look for love. If you cannot find love in people, some of it, some of them people search for love in pornography, in masturbation, in sleeping around, in, in maybe some of some even obsess in, in their partners. That's where you find people are even committing suicide, killing each other because of killing your your girlfriend or your your boyfriend or your husband or your wife because you love them too much you've loved them too much you've idolized them they've become your god they've become your god and god does not want this for any of us i'll read the philippians chapter 4 verse verse 7 in the king james version i'll read from verse 6 it says but be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known unto god and the peace of god which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through through christ jesus so this peace this peace that you're searching for in your job in your spouse in relationships in your friendships this peace you cannot find it anywhere but in Christ Jesus. Only in him will you find peace. Only in him will you find freedom. Only in him 
will you be able to be to to fight, to get the protection that you desire only in him only in Jesus Christ and let me show you the type of rest that you get in Christ i was thinking i thought about this thing about rest and being living under the under the shelter of the most high being living under the protection of the most high this morning before i slept all i could think about was this rest this rest that this the the the, the people in the bible the the famous people this rest that they had I, it always fascinates me it amazes me the type of faith and the rest that they had in christ even before jesus christ the type of faith that they had in god because the old testament many talks about god and their encounters his relationship with his people and how they disappointed him the israelites and how he god despite how much he loved them they kept on going back to their old ways they kept on going back to their vomit for lack of a better word because you know once you're delivered once you you remove maybe you are sick you have a stomach problem and then you go out and you vomit it out when you go back to your sin it's like going back to your vomit that's the most um that's the the, the best i think image i can try and put and show you how bad it is when you keep on going back to our old ways it's like taking back that vomit i know it's disgusting and all but the vomit that has already left your your body you've already been set free but you go to take it back it's disgusting and your situation will be even worse than before the shame the guilt the trauma it will be even worse than before and when you read the old testament you see how god tried to show his love to his children so much but despite his unconditional love they kept on sinning against him choosing other gods monuments idols choosing power choosing money choosing other people fellow people above god and god is a just god when you sin he would declare punishment on people but the same god would come and give the people a way out to to try and rescue them to set them free from the trap of the enemy because as i told you the enemy is not it's not your fellow human being it's not the person who who keeps on sinning against you hi john thank you for joining god bless you so this this the, the real enemy it's not your 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 brother or your sister who keeps on irritating you keeps on plotting against you your real enemy is not is not the person who keeps on planning evil against you the real enemy is the devil who's using them as agents of darkness to come and destroy you plot against you all these people well, i would urge you go and read your bible take some time when the more you read the bible the more you will understand the nature of god how loving he is how kind he is how his love is unconditional such that no matter what we do he always gives us a way out you see why it was saying in in Psalms 91 that those who live in the shelter of the most high will find rest in the shadow of the almighty and and the, towards the end of Psalms 91 we've just read it I'll read it again the condition to get this superior protection to get this covering to basically get the full potential the promises that God has given has declared upon your life you see verse 9 of Psalms 91 it says if you make the Lord your refuge if you make the most high your shelter no evil will conquer you no plague will come near your home for he will order his angels to protect you wherever you go this means the type of protection and covering you have will be higher than the one that you have when you when you're not living in him when you're not staying in his presence he will still protect you but the type of protection that you will get when you're in him is superior this type of protection will even shock your enemies will even shock those who are plotting evil against you because no matter what they try to do it will not be it nothing will succeed against you and let me show you an example of this as to a scripture that that god put in my in my heart as i was thinking about the type of rest the type of beautiful rest this is rest that is beautiful because it does not make sense rest that is captivating it, it captures your attention rest that makes you want to 
to know this God more. And this is from the book of Acts chapter 16. If you have your Bible, you can go with me there, Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. From verse 16. And the title is Paul and Silas in prison. And it says, One day we were going down to the place of prayer. We met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. So this was Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts and he's the one who's narrating it. He's, he's telling the story of Paul and Silas because he used to travel with them a lot of times. He's the one who documented what most of the things that Paul did in Acts, in the book of Acts. But most of the, the other books of the New Testament, most of them are written by Paul. So in this, in this uh, book of Acts, chapter 16, verse 16, it's... Luke was writing, that's why he's saying, one day as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. So this was Paul, Silas, and Luke, and perhaps a couple of other people. They were traveling, they were ministering to people. When you read the book of Acts, you'll see Paul, this same Paul that I'm talking about, before he was anointed, before he was chosen by God, he was a persecutor of the Christians. He was a persecutor of the, of the former disciples of Jesus and their followers. He used to persecute them. In fact, when God captured his, captured his attention, when God arrested his heart, he was on his way to go and gather basically permission to go and arrest all the believers and put them in prison because of how they were professing about Jesus and how he came to save them and all that. So the poor and the most amazing thing is that Paul was a Pharisee. And when you read about the life of Jesus, you see that the Pharisees and Sadducees are the ones who opposed the, the preaching of Jesus so much. So in this opposition of the of jesus did not end with him dying and resurrecting and going to heaven it 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 went on even to his disciples so here paul this same paul that went that is now being used by god uh in the book of acts chapter 16 i would urge you to read the book of acts it's very fascinating and interesting it shows you how god god is the one who convicts the hearts of people to change so you can be praying for people trying to push jesus on them trying to tell them about the love of jesus but if god has not convicted it in their hearts for them to change there's nothing you can do about it all you can do is pray for them pray for god to convict them so this paul was very wicked in fact the bible has not even talked when you read the historical when you do research and you read the history about the type of before he was called Saul, he was wicked he was killing believers arresting them doing so many terrible things to them and this is the same man in acts chapter 9 who god captured and convicted his heart and revealed to him that truly he, it's it's not even his his disciples that paul Saul had been persecuting it's jesus himself in fact, Jesus asked him, Paul, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? In Acts chapter 9, you can go and read it. So this same Paul, when he was convicted and God changed his heart and he got saved and he believed in Jesus, he now went and started preaching the same gospel that he had been persecuting. And you, of course, you would expect him to receive the same persecution or even worse than he, used, than he, than he, than he gave to people. Because as it says, do unto others as you want it to be done unto you. Whatever you do on this earth, it will come back to you. Whatever you do, it will come back to you. So Paul received a lot of persecution. He was mocked, he was beaten, he was arrested. And in this incident we are about to read is one of the places where he was arrested. But this there's something special about this chapter specifically. So I, I just wanted to I just wanted to give you that small background. So let's go to Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it says, one day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit that enabled her to tell the future. She earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. She followed Paul, 
Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. So this man, this woman, this little girl that they met, the slave girl, she was a slave and she, and she had this, you can call it a gift, but it was not really a gift. It was an, an evil spirit that was giving her the ability to prophesy and tell the future because you see, it says she earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. So this was not the spirit of God that was dwelling in her. This was an evil spirit because even the devil can see the future. That's why you find that the powers of, that's why it, it comes back again to Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. That we are not fighting against flesh and flesh and bone. That we are fighting against spiritual forces. So this girl was operating with the spirit of divination, the spirit of witchcraft. That's how she could be able to foretell the future. And since she was a slave, all her foretelling, has her masters were using, were basically using her to get money. But when, but when this girl saw Paul and and Luke and all these other people that were following them, she went around following them, following following them, shouting, "These men are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved." So you see. This this spirit that is within her, it knows. That's why that's why this 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 we have to be very careful with the the spirits. We have, we always have to test the spirit, the people that tell us about God, because they are false pastors, false brethren, false false teachers. There is a lot of deception that is going going on around in the world. The devil is always at work trying to steal, to kill, to destroy our lives. So we have to be careful to discern between the spirit of God and the spirit of the devil because the devil was once in heaven. He was an angel of God. And because he tried to overthrow God, that's why he was banished from heaven. And that's why when he came to earth, he's taking advantage. He's trying to bring as many people with him down because he knows at the end of it all, when Jesus comes back for us, his believers, the, when Jesus comes back for the people who de de declare and believe that Jesus is Lord and they believe that he came to save them, when he comes back for us, the devil knows that he's going to perish in hell. So he's searching for as many people as possible to go down with him. That's why his plan is always to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So we have to be very careful to discern between the spirit of God and the spirit of the devil. Like these people that this little girl was, was talking to. Hi, Queen. Thank you for joining. God bless you. So this little girl... When people, when, whenever she would prophesy to them about the things that God, that these people perhaps thought it was the spirit of God that was working through her because she would come and tell them about their future. You see, it says she earned a lot of money for her masters by telling fortunes. So she was telling them the future. And people are curious. People love prophecy a lot. If there's one area that the devil is capturing people is through prophecy. That's where they are false prophets. And people are being deceived because these false prophets are acting. They are, they are acting like, like they are of God. But they are acting using sp the spirit of witchcraft and divination. So this, uh, this little girl, she went around shouting, telling the, telling the people, these men are servants of God, are servants of the Most High God, and they have come to tell you how to be saved. And this went on day after day until Paul got ex ex exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her. Now, you see, you see the spirit within her is not of God because if it's of God, Paul would not have been irritated. In fact, he would have been happy that this woman, this lady, she can see that we are of God. But why would he be irritated if she was of God? So you see, it's truly really a demon that was in her. And God, Paul got so irritated that he said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And instantly it left her. This spirit that had been given this girl the ability to prophesy, to tell the future. This was a demon. It left her immediately. And when it left her, it says, her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered. So they grabbed Paul and Silas and drag them before the authorities at the marketplace. Look at what is happening. Paul and his team, they are busy minding their business, they are going preaching, only for them to come across a little girl who's operating under the spirit of witchcraft and a demon that is speaking through her, giving her the power to prophesy and to tell the future. This girl is basically the one following them. 
going around and around shouting and telling people that these are servants of the Most High God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. And Paul was, the first day he ignored her, the second day, but after a while, Paul got irritated because he could discern that this was an evil spirit within her. And he cast out that demon from her. And immediately he cast the demon from her. Her masters. This means perhaps her masters had were even the ones who had initiated her. They had done some spells on her or something to make her be able to make money on for them. Because people are usually initiated. This is how people are initiated into witchcraft. It, it can be either through food. It can be through drinks. It can be through the clothes that you wear. It can be through prayer, laying of hands. That's why you should be careful who play, prays for you and lays, lays hands on you. The devil is very wicked and manipulative. So perhaps this girl had been initiated by these masters because why would why why does it say her master's hopes of wealth were now shattered? And because these men now saw that now, oh no, we've lost our, uh, the, 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 our ability to make money. This means they used to earn a lot of money. But now the demon has left the girl so she does not have the ability to prophesy anymore. And so it says, they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. And they said, the whole city is in uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials, they are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. So you see, they went to lie against Paul and Silas just because Paul and Silas had done a deliverance. Actually, Paul is the one who had done a deliverance on this little girl. So they went to lie on them. So sometimes when you're doing the will of God, when you're walking in the gates of the Holy Spirit, you will receive persecution. Actually, most times you will receive persecution because it's the devil at work. The devil is the one who's planting seeds of disunity, planting division, planting hatred. So unfortunately, verse 22, it says, a mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with wooden rods. They were beaten severely and then they were thrown into prison. Just look at this situation. You, you're minding your business, you're going around preaching, telling people about Jesus, only for you to, exactly, it will cost you a lot to walk in the will of God. But at the end of it all, it will be worth it. So, unfortunately, Paul and Silas, they were minding their business, preaching the word of God, only for them to find themselves in this situation just because they've, they've delivered a little girl who was tormented by demons. The demons were, were it seemed like she was, she was, she was at peace. It seemed like she was happy. It seemed, it seemed like she had a very powerful gift. Only the, the only problem was that these people, the gift was not of God. It was a demon that was working through her. So now Paul and Silas, they were beaten. You see, it says they were stripped. They were beaten. It's, it's, it, it doesn't, it's not just, it's, it's, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't just end with them being beaten. They were stripped. Grown-up men removed, their clothes were removed. They were beaten, not just beaten by, by some, some few men and all, beaten by wooden rods. I don't know if you can picture this in your mind. Wooden rods, sticks wooden roads and then they were, were told that they were severely beaten this means their beating was so bad that they were probably at the point of death and then they were thrown into prison and he goes on to say the jailer was ordered to make sure they didn't escape so the jailer put them into the inner dungeon and clamped their feet in the stocks so it, it's not just enough that these men have been humiliated, they have been stripped, they have been beaten severely, they have been thrown into prison, and now their situation is even getting worse. They are being put in an inner dungeon. This means they are not just put in a prison where everyone can, you know these prisons where you just go, you can see every, they are basically the, the, the doors are opened, you can see, you can walk by and see them. Not, not That's not the type of prison they were put in. They were put in an inner dungeon. I don't know if you know what a dungeon is. A dungeon is like a dark a inner place, very hidden. Basically, there's no hope for you. There's no, there's no way you can escape. It's like being put in a cave and locked there. That's the type of a picture you should have when you think of a dungeon. And to make it worse, they were clamped. Their feet were clamped. They were tied up. So 
I don't know if you can picture this scenario. These men are they've been humiliated, grown up men, they've been they've been stripped, they've been beaten, they've been thrown in a prison a deeper. And then to make it worse, they are being tied up. So I can't even imagine how they were, the type of pain they were in, the humiliation. It's not just the physical trauma of being beaten, but also the mental, the trauma. These are things that don't just leave your mind. Uh, just imagine the the the, the, the veteran soldiers, the war, the, the the men of war that usually go to fight for our country. When they come back, most of them usually come back traumatized because of the type of things that they witnessed in the war, the type of things that they had to do in self-defense or as they were trying to defend their country. Some of them even had to end up, they had to kill people as a, as a form of defending themselves. So these memories, they never leave you. Now imagine being beaten like that and mocked and, and embarrassed in public. These are memories that don't just leave you like that. But there's something that's amazing about these men. There's a reason that, has, that God has led me to this, to this scripture. And it's in verse 25. It says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. Just look at this man. If, if, you are, if you found yourself in this situation, would you have the, even the desire to sing and to pray? These are men who we are told they've been severely beaten. They've been mocked. They've been, they, they are tied up. Where, where do you get the strength to pray and to sing if it's not for God? Is, it, is this normal? This is not normal. You cannot do this unless you have the spirit of God dwelling in you. You can't. When I, when I, it's the, this morning when I was thinking about rest in Psalms 91, God took me to this scripture. And I couldn't help but I was even almost crying because I was like, wow, this man, this is what it means to be sold out for Christ, to surrender your whole heart. You don't care. No matter what happens, no matter how much you're humiliated, you're beaten, you do not care. This is the, this is the type of people, it's amazing. Where did they get the strength to pray and to sing? And their singing must have been very beautiful. They must have been singing with so much zeal that we are told that the other prisoners were listening. This means the anointing must have been oozing out of them. Because in fact, when you when you're in at your weakest point, when you're at your weakest point, that's when God moves through you the, the best, the most, the, the biggest way. Let me let me read that scripture for you. Second Corinthians chapter 12. This is the same Paul. We'll come back to Acts chapter 16. But Second Corinthians chapter 12, it says, verse 6. If I wanted to boast, this was Paul speaking, I would be no fool in doing so because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I have received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh. A messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Whenever I read this part, I always ask myself, what, what could it be that Paul was battling? Was it an addiction? Was it a sickness? Where well, It's never been made clear what exactly the problem was. But Paul was saying that in order for him not to become proud, he was given a thorn in his flesh, a weakness, something that he, that he had to live with as a reminder that for him because the type of anointing that he had paul was so anointed that people when they i believe i don't remember clearly but i think it was handkerchiefs that had touched his body when people would place them on themselves they would be healed this is the type of anointing that he carried so for him not to become proud he had this weakness this thorn in his, in his flesh that he says that he was a messenger from Satan to torment him and keep him from becoming proud. So sometimes God allows us to go to have a certain weakness as a source of, to remind us 
that he's the one who's fighting for us, that we should never for, think even in our wildest imagination that we are doing things on our own, basically to prevent us from being proud. So the part that brought me here is verse 8. It says, Three different times, this is 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 8. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weaknesses. Oh, Asher. This, it says, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, in the hardships, in the persecutions, the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is where this verse came. This is where this verse truly says, when I am weak, when we are weak, that's when we are strongest. Because when we are weak, that's when God's power can work through us and we can the glory can go back to God. Now let's go back to Acts chapter 16. Now I believe you see why Paul and Silas, how they could, where they could get the strength and the, the passion, the love for God. I believe it was the Holy Spirit it was the Holy Spirit that was working through them, giving them the boldness, the ability, the strength to sing, to pray and to sing hymns to God. And their singing and their praise was so powerful that the other prisoners were listening. Why, why do they have to emphasize that the prisoners were listening? It's because the anointing must have been evident. Because if it's not, the prisoners would have probably been walking them. Oh, shut up. Why are you making noise? Stop making noise. You know how people are always talking, trying to persecute you? If their singing was not anointed, and if their praises were not anointed, no one would have been, people would have been irritated. But it seems like their singing was so powerful, the anointing must have been so heavy in that place that they couldn't help but listen. It was actually perhaps soothing them, giving them peace. Now this is the type of rest that only God can give. Rest in such a place, rest in a prison, in such a deep prison, rest in a place of mockery, in a place of pain, <coughs> in a place of humiliation. <coughs> Sorry, I have a bit of a cold. So this is a type of rest that you can only get in God. A type of rest that you can only get in Jesus. This is a type of rest that can make you sing and jump even when your, your, your body is full of wounds from being beaten by wooden rods. This is a type of rest that can make you even want to sing despite whatever you've gone through. And the most amazing thing happened. It didn't just end. The, this, this scripture is not just powerful because of their type of love for God. But it's powerful because of what happened because of their praises and worship and their praying. Verse 25, I'll read it again. Around midnight, Paul and Silas, it was even at midnight. Look at the timing. It's, not, it's a time that does not make sense. It's a time that is very in, could be inconveniencing to other people. These prisoners could have been sleeping, but they were listening. They didn't mind. They didn't seem to mind. So it says, around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening. Suddenly, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison was shaken to its foundations. These people are singing, they are praising, they are worshiping, they are praying. And then suddenly, an earthquake, um, an earthquake that was so big that it shook the foundations of the prison, and all the doors immediately flew open. And the chains of every prisoner fell off. Ha. Whenever I read this part, I'm like, wow, look at the power of God. Look at the power of God. Look at what God did, not just for Paul and Silas. The earthquake 
the, the shaking of the prison, it was so mighty that the chains fell from every prisoner, every one of them. All of them were basically set free because of the praise and worship. There is power in praise and worship. There is power in praise and worship. God moves mightily when you praise and worship him. God moves mightily in your weakness. God moves mightily when you when you are in pain, when you are when you're humiliated, when your emotions are, are tampered with, when you're emotional, when you're struggling to believe. But these men, they did not even have an ounce of doubt. They knew that this is the type of rest that they had in God. Because they, they had been dwelling in God's presence so much, such that no matter what was happening physically, the pain, the pain they must have been going through, it didn't matter. They didn't care about their pain. It's like they were numb. I believe perhaps they were they, perhaps they received healing immediately. They started praying and, and praising God because how could they be singing with so much zeal? Their singing was so powerful that it shook the, the foundations of the prison. This is not just random singing. This is not singing that is bored. This is singing from the heart. Singing that is full of the Holy Spirit. And their singing caused all the prison doors to open and all the chains of the prisoners to be, to be opened. Hmm. And the, the most amazing thing happened. It didn't just end here. We are told in verse 27, the jailer, the one who had put them in jail in that inner dungeon, he woke up to see that all the prison doors were open and he assumed that all the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword to kill himself. This man was so frustrated and scared because he knew that if all these prisoners escaped, there's no way he would survive. This, keep in mind, this was during the Roman period. The Romans were brutal. They were merciless at those times. There was no joking around. There was no mercy. When you do something wrong, you're killed. That's the type of society that they were living in in those days. So this, this jailer, when he woke up and saw that this means, you see, when he woke up, this means he was even asleep. This is, this is odd. How could he have been asleep when Paul and Silas are busy praising God and singing and the attention of all the prisoners is on them listening and this jailer was asleep? So it's like, this is how God works. God works in very strange ways. This means that God is the one who put this jailer in that sleep, such a deep sleep that he didn't even realize that what, what happened. He didn't even, hmm. perhaps it's even the earthquake that woke him up. Because we are told the jailer woke up to see the prison doors open. This means he didn't even hear the earthquake. He just woke up after it had already, it had already, already happened and the doors had been opened. What type of deep sleep was this man in? If this is not God, who could it be? This is how God works. And this man, this jailer, he was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We are all here. Another fascinating thing, all these prisoners, when the doors opened, naturally instinct would be for them to, to go out and run, to escape. But somehow, all these prisoners stayed in their cells. They didn't escape. So this whole story is very interesting. It's amazing. Perhaps the prisoners were in shock. They were wondering what's happening. Maybe that's why they didn't run. Or maybe Paul told them not to run and they, they listened. Who knows? It's not, the Bible just gives a summary of what happened. And the most amazing thing is that in verse 29 it says, The jailer called for travel lights. Sorry. The jailer called for lights and ran to the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Look at how God works. This is a bit, this is someone, a jailer, the one who put them in that prison, is now asking them how he how he can be saved because he knew that these people must be of God. There's no way that all the how could they have been able to open the, the chains of all the prisoners? There's no way they could be able to do this if it's if God is not on their side. And they replied. 
believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with him and with all who lived in his household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared, cared for them and washed their wounds. This same jailer who had been the one who put them in that jail, perhaps he had thrown them. Exactly, this, this whole thing was supernatural. This whole encounter in this chapter 16, verse, from verse 16, it's supernatural. It shows the presence of God. Hmm. This, same, this is how God works. You cannot put God in a box. You cannot predict what he will do. Look at a man getting saved, him and his household getting saved, being preached to by the same man who we put in prison. And now this same man who has accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior, the jailer, is even the one now taking care of the wounds of Paul and Silas. So now it's, you see, this is now, I believe this is now when the, the anointing has cooled down and then the God is now, God has now put it in the heart of the jailer to take care of Paul and Silas. Hmm. This story, it just shows the power of God. And beyond the power of God, it shows the type of rest and peace that can only be found in God. Because it does not make sense. It does not make sense just a moment it that it does not make sense how you can have such rest and peace during the time of such pain and humiliation. But through the story of Paul and Silas, we see that only God can give you such peace and rest to even praise him and pray in times of pain, in times of struggle, in, time of, in times of humiliation. And how God can turn it around. When you read that whole story, you can go and continue reading the rest of chapter 16 you will see how God works in very powerful ways. And God is always there to defend you, to fight for you. Hmm. So today I'm here to tell you that abide in the shelter of the Most High. Dwell in, his shelter, in the shelter of God. This means continue seeking God live in his presence never depart from his presence never let a day go by without you praying without you committing your day before him asking him for direction basically build a relationship with him he's your friend he's your friend this song says what a friend we have in jesus what a friend we have in jesus all our sins everything he be, he took it all for us all our sins and griefs to bear he took all our pain he took upon himself our sins to die such a humiliating death you know something that the bible that people don't know when they read the bible is that when jesus some people not all people some people don't know is that jesus died a very humiliating death he wasn't just beaten mocked persecuted and hanged on a cross he was also stripped naked he was crucified naked this is this is such a painful death and terrible death for a man who was blameless a man who was pure a man who did not have any sin on him but he did all that because he loved us so much because God loved us so much and he wanted to show how much he loved us by giving his own son to come and die for our sins so that because once you accept Jesus Christ and you believe in his death and resurrection, your sins are wiped clean, your past is wiped clean, you're made new. For him, Jesus, the son of God, to come out from his throne of grace in heaven. Let me show you who this Jesus is. Who he truly is in his glory and honor for him to accept to come and die such a humiliating death 
let's go to Revelations chapter 1. This, the book of Revelation was written by John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, because he was taken into heaven and he was shown all these things, all these revelations about what is to come. And when you, when you read from verse 9 of Revelation chapter 1, it says, the title is the vision of the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a phrase that Jesus used to, used to refer to himself, how he was born of man, but he is God. He used to refer to himself as the Son of Man. And it says, I, John, am your brother and partner in suffering and, God's, and, and in God's kingdom and in the patient endurance to which Jesus calls us. I was exiled to the land of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. So you see, John, this was one of the, who used to be the disciple of Jesus. He was put in prison because of his testimony, because of his ministry. Now he's the one who's giving his, his story. And he goes on to say, I was exiled to the island of Patmos for preaching the word of God and for my testimony about Jesus. It was the Lord's day and I was worshipping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard, the, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. This means he was worshipping in the spirit. He was worshipping from his heart. Basically, he was even perhaps praying in tongues worshiping in the spirit praying in tongues his heart was committed despite him being in prison you see his this is similar wasn't paul also in prison when he was worshiping so you see this is the type of attitude that god expects us to has to have during times of trouble and pain he wants us to remember that just as this jesus suffered on this earth so we so will we suffer we will also suffer because there's no way that the master can can that the, the servant can be greater than the master we are servants of God. There's no way we can be we can be greater than Jesus. There's no way we can evade suffering. And when Jesus himself went through a lot of suffering, so even John himself was also in prison and he was worshiping God in the spirit. And then he had this encounter. It goes on to say, verse 10, it was the Lord's day and I was worshiping in the spirit. Suddenly, I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast it's it it said write in a book everything you see and send it to the seven churches in the city of ephesus Sim, simna pagamam Thyatira, sardis philadelphia and laodicea when i turned to see who was speaking to me i saw seven gold lampstands and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the son of man he was wearing a long robe with, with, a, gold, with a gold sash across his, his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. This is John. John, the same John who used to be so comfortable with Jesus. Even there's a, even a scripture that says how John used to be comfortable even lying on Jesus, lying on his chest. When Jesus was on the earth, he was their friend. He was there he was the disciples loved him so much this same john that is now having this encounter he's seeing jesus in all his glory and his in his true form he's seeing him you see it says and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the son of man he was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across across his chest his head and his hair was white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were like flames of fire his feet were like polished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp, sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. This same John, the one who used to be so comfortable with Jesus, even lying on his chest and, and being so comfortable, friendly with him. John now sees Jesus in all his glory and honor, and he cannot even stand to look at him. He collapsed on the floor immediately. It's like him seeing Jesus. He could not stand the glory of, of Jesus in his true form. We are told that when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. This was the instinct because he could not stand the glory of Jesus in his true form. This was now his body the way he usually is. But while he was on earth, 
John and the fellow disciples, they got comfortable with him because he, he came as a man. And it says, but he laid his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. This was John having an encounter with Jesus, the one who mentored him while he was on earth, the one who taught him everything he knew about salvation. And now he's seeing him in all his glory. Hmm. He's seeing him in all his glory. This is the Jesus. This Jesus that John could not stand to look at. This Jesus that John collapsed at his feet when he saw him because his, the glory was too much. He couldn't stand it. He collapsed as though he were dead in Revelation 1. This same Jesus is the one who came to earth. This same Jesus is the one who came to earth, grew up, was born of a woman, born by a virgin. Grew up as a human being was persecuted, was mocked by the same people that he created. Because when you read Genesis chapter 1, you'll see that God spoke, God said, let us, let us create God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was there when the earth was being created. Jesus was there when these men were being formed. And this Jesus had to come to earth as a man to endure the mockery, the humiliation, of these same men that he created to endure the mockery the humiliation of being stripped being beaten being crucified on the cross like a prisoner like a criminal being crucified in between criminals thieves for despite him being innocent this same jesus is the one who came to die for us I want that to sink in, that he accepted to come out from his place of glory in heaven, to come and die such a humiliating death just because of us. Just because of us. Hmm. When you think about it, it will, it will do something to you. You will realize the type of sacrifice that Jesus made for us. Whenever I think about it, I'm, I feel very emotional because I'm like, I don't think I can be able to take, I can't be able to handle such pain for people who don't even love me. But this is God, him offering his son. How do you think God was feeling when he was in heaven watching as his son was being beaten, mocked, put to shame, crucified and killed? despite him being innocent but he could not stop anything because he was doing this as a sign to show us how much he loved us so today i'm here to tell you that only in jesus can you find rest this type of rest that we've read about in Acts 16 the type of rest that can make you sing and praise the type of rest that can make you remain positive even in the midst of the most painful circumstances. So I don't know who you are, whether you are not at rest, whether you are not at peace. I don't know if you desire to have this rest, but personally, this is the type of rest that I desire to have every day during those moments of weakness, those moments of, of, of struggling with negative thoughts, those moments of having to go through difficult situations and still believe in God, still trust in him. Remember what, what David said in Psalms 91. Let's go back there. David said, This I declare about the Lord in Psalms 91 verse 2. He alone is my refuge and my place of safety. He is my God and I trust him. 
for he will rescue you from every trap. We've just seen a story of how Paul and Silas were freed and not just them, but every other prisoner in that place was freed because of God, because of the power of God. This was a physical trap, but it was way deeper than this. This was a spiritual battle. For them to be beaten and mocked after delivering a young girl who, who used to be tormented by a demon, you would expect them to be praised. Oh, thank you so much for what you've done for this girl. You set her free. But of course, the devil is always at work. And this was not good for the masters, the ones who are using this girl to make money in Acts chapter 16. Verse 16, you can read there. Go and read it later on once again. You would expect to be rewarded for doing good. You'd expect to be rewarded for believing in Jesus. But the world is, this world is not our home. As a believer, as long as you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become the enemy of the devil. And he does everything to try and bring you down. But as long as you hold on, as long as you hold on to God, hold on to his promises, believe in him, trust in him, as long as you do that, he will protect you, he will fight for you. Look at what he did for Paul and Silas. Look, read the book of Acts. You will see the countless number of times God rescued the apostles from troubling and difficult situations. There was even an incident, incident where Paul was beaten by a poisonous snake and the people around him expected him to die immediately, but nothing happened. In fact, he threw, the, he threw out the snake as though nothing had happened, as though he'd just been hit like this. And it was a poisonous snake such that even the people around it around him ended up thinking that he's a god because he didn't die this is the type of protection and covering this is the type of rest even paul for him to be beaten by a snake naturally he would panic and start getting scared but he did he was so unbothered you should you read this i think in i think it's um let me let me confirm i think it's in acts chapter 28 let me confirm so that you can go and read it in your own time Acts chapter, yes, Acts chapter 28, you can, from verse 1 to around um, verse 6, go and read it in your own time. Paul was so unbothered when he was beaten by a snake that he threw the snake away like this into the fire. He was putting up a fire, he was uh, lighting up a fire, it was at night, they had just been from a ship, shipwreck. They had been deserted on a certain island and they had been rescued by some people. The, the people that rescued them, they knew that they were, they were prisoners. So when Paul was trying to light the fire, the snake that, was, that had been attracted by the fire came from the fire and beat him. And he was so unbothered that he threw the snake into the fire and went on about moving around as though nothing had happened. So that the people around him were just looking around him saying, oh, this man, this man, he must be a very big, bad, bad, he must have committed very terrible crimes. This is his justice, he's going to die. But they, they were shocked, they were put to shame because they waited and waited, nothing is happening. They were expecting him to swell up and die because of the poison in this, from the snake, but nothing happened. This is a type of rest. When you read about Paul, you see this type of unbothered, this type of faith that is so unbothered. I've talked about it before, unbothered faith. You can go and listen to it. I preached about it at the, at the beginning of this year. This faith is so unbothered that it will make people around you restless and uncomfortable. They'll be wondering, why, why is she always at peace? Why is he always at peace? How can he be at peace in this situation? They should be, they should be frustrated, but... When you are in Christ, he gives you peace that surpasses all understanding, peace that does not make sense. So at this moment, I just want to tell you that Jesus loves you so much that he came to die to, for us such a humiliating death just so that we could be saved from the trap of the enemy, so that we could have this gift of salvation and eternity with him in heaven at the end of, at the end of it all. So at this moment, I want to give you an opportunity to, to surrender your life to this Jesus, this Jesus that gives you this rest that is 
this rest that cannot be attained from the world, this Jesus that sets you free from the traps of the enemy, this Jesus that doesn't care about your past once you come to him. Look at Paul. He was once a persecutor, persecutor of the church, and now he's the one who wrote most of the books in the New Testament. He's the one who was so anointed. He was even more anointed. The things he did were even more powerful than the disciples of Jesus who lived with Jesus. While him, Paul, didn't even get to meet Jesus, but he was so anointed because he rededicated his, he surrendered everything to Christ Jesus. And he was used mightily by God. He suffered, but through all his sufferings, God fought for him and set him free from the traps of the enemy. There was even at a point, the, there are so many scriptures about Paul, there was even a point that there were some people who were fasting for 40 days, I believe. They, if, if I'm not wrong, they say that they will fast until they kill Saul. They kill Paul. Can you imagine people fasting for, for you to die? People fasting. So, and they said they will not eat and drink anything until they kill Paul. But God brought to the attention of Paul the plans of these wicked people and Paul escaped. So I've, I've always wondered, these people who are fasting, they even saw an oath that they would not eat, they would rather die than, than they would make sure that they die before Paul dies, before, be, before Paul gets away without dying. So I always wonder, these people, most likely they died because they had sown an oath, or maybe they went back on their oath and escaped and changed their mind. The Bible does not say what happened, but these people, this is how the devil is always plotting evil against you. But through it all, <coughs> through it all, God will help you overcome. He will fight for you. He will protect you. Psalms 91 will reflect in your life as long as you dwell you live in his presence. So the shelter of the Most High is the safest place to be. It's actually the only place to be because once you are in his presence, everything else will work out for you. So I just want to give you this opportunity to rededicate your life to God or to come to him for the first time if you've never done so. I will lead you in the salvation prayer. This is a decision that you make. That Lord, here I am. I want to be free. I've been suffering. I've been addicted. I've been struggling with believing in you. But now I want to find that rest. I want that peace that you gave your this your this you, you gave Paul. I want that peace that you could give these people despite their suffering. I want the peace that you could give Job despite his pain in the Bible. I want this peace. So if you're ready to rededicate your life to God, to come to God for the first time, just say this prayer after me. Father Lord, I come into your presence as a sinner. I confess all my sins. Please forgive me. I didn't know any better. Or I knew better if you did. I promise not to go back to my old ways. I believe that Jesus Christ came and died for me on the cross of Calvary so that my sins can be wiped away. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. Be the Lord over my life. I promise to serve you forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Now put your right hand on your chest and declare that you are saved. Declare that you will go and sin no more. Declare that you will seek his face. Lord, I thank you for your children. Lord, I thank you for this father that you brought them, Lord. Your children who've come to you for the first time. Your children who've rededicated their lives to you, Lord. I bring them before you, Lord. Cover them with the blood of Jesus. Set them free from the traps of the enemy, Lord. Draw them to you. Fill them with your love. Fill them with a desire to know you more, to read your word, to spend time in your presence. Teach them how to dwell in your presence, how to live in your presence. Fill them afresh, Lord. Fill them with your Holy Spirit now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, take over their hearts, their minds, their souls, their bodies. Holy Spirit, purge them. Remove any evil deposit in them. Set them free from any addictions. Remove any evil desires, those lustful desires, those addictions. 
Set them free here. Kato pato maneke te kelele le kasaka te la bola ba ataka rura kusaka te kelele la ba Holy Spirit take over here. So kapota dina mona kate kelele kase kato kapota lele la ba ana kapota kola le kese kete kelele la ba Holy Spirit take over here. Sapa take over their households, take over their hearts, their minds. Here is kapota pa take over their bodies here. Kate lele la ba ana kapota kora rase kata pa open their spiritual eyes open their spiritual ears here so paha give them encounters with you oh lord in dreams visions here so kapa physical encounters with you lord let them hear your audible voice hare sapa hato pare raba let them hear your voice hare sapa that still small voice here sapa hato raro sakapa let your voice be the only voice that they hear hare sapa tere ba i come against that spirit of manipulation here kato pare ba set them free hare kato kare Sekete Kiriba, Hana Kapota Koda Reke Sekete Kiriba, Holy Ghost, take over their homes, take over their husbands, take over their wives, take over their children, take over their parents, take over Hera Sokapa, take over Hera Sakoteba, through their example, draw people to you, Yeresi Kapate Reba, cover them with the blood of Jesus, Yeresi Apotaba, Hatamane Maha, may they burn for you, Lord, may we all burn for you, Haresa Pa, feel us afraid. Lord, he rasika pa. May your Holy Spirit fall upon us, he pa. Fall upon us, he rasika. May your glory fill our homes, he rasika po ta ba. Hatora reka se kata pa. Lord, we desire to have encounters with you, he rasika. Life-changing encounters like those of Saul, he rasika. Like that blood of John, he rasika pa. Encounters that will he rasika po ta pa. Encounters that will put the fear of God in us, he rasika pa. Encounters that will give us a reverence for you, he rasika. Reka pota pa etaru rase katera ba Holy Ghost take over O Lord take over O Lord take over O Lord take over our homes take over our hearts take over our minds take over our bodies take over soft and those stubborn hearts here so kapota reda ba hane kapota kora reda ba hare sekete kere reda ba hana kopato kare reda ba Lord we thank you for the gift of salvation we thank you for your love for your grace hare kapate pa we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation, for your mercy, for your forgiveness of our sins, O oh Lord. Help us to dwell in the shelter. Help us to abide in you. Help us to abide in you. Help us to abide in you. Teach us to abide in you, O oh Lord. Teach us to abide in you hare kapota kora roka se kate kare raba hana mano kapate kere 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 kase kate raba no take over o lord take over o lord take over o lord help us to walk in your will help us to abide in you hare kapota kora roka se kete kere kere raba hana kapota kora roka se kete kere kere raba hana kapota rore re kese kete kere kere raba Hana mona sekete kelele akasoka toka lele leba. Hana mona sekete kelele asekato laba. Lord, we thank you. We exalt your name. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. Hear us, O Fatiba. Lord, we thank you. We lift your name on high, O Lord. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Just tell him thank you. Tell him thank you. Tell him thank you for what he's done for you. Tell him thank you for the father that he's brought you. Tell him thank you. This is the best decision you could have made to come to him, to surrender your life to him, to seek his face because only in the shelter of the Most High will you find rest. Will you find freedom? Will you find protection? Will you find a, find a covering? He will protect you. He will guide you. He will open doors for you. But you have to seek Him. You have to live your life for Him. And when you do, you will have peace and rest. 
this rest that, that you've been searching for in the world, this peace that you've been searching for in people, this love that you've been searching for in people, he will give you all that and even more. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So seek God, and your life will never be the same again. If you say the salvation prayer and you don't have a Bible, I would urge you to go and buy a physical Bible. I would recommend the New Living Translation version. It's easier to understand. But whichever version you're comfortable with, there's a King James, there's a easy translation, there's a message, there's a passion translation. There, there are so many versions, but I would recommend the, the New Living Translation version. Read about Jesus. Read about him in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Read about him. Spend time in his presence. Fast. Seek his face. Draw closer to him. Stay away from sin. The things that you used to do, stay away from them. And your life will never be the same again. Your life will never be the same again. And if you, if you, if you, if you can't be able to wear a Bible right now, you can also download it on Google Play Store. It's, it, it, it's easily there. It's called the U-Version Bible. The, the U-Version Bible. It's, it's very easy to understand. It has the audio Bible. It has uh, uh, scripture plans, Bible reading plans. It has videos about... It, it has a lot of content. But basically, read about Jesus. And your life will never be the same again. So thank you so much for joining abide in the shelter of the most high live in his presence don't just be going into his presence wherever you want something but learn to make it, make it a daily habit actually make it a place of rest the more you spend time with him you'll find yourself even desiring to you the desires that the things that you used to find joy in you will find an even deeper joy you start finding that you're losing interest in other things. You just want to spend time with God. You just want to live right for Him. And when you start experiencing that, you will know that you're in the right path. You, may, you will get some trouble, some some trials, because just as this, Jesus went through persecution, so will us believers. We will also experience persecution and struggles. But God will help us overcome. He will help us overcome. So, spend time in His presence and you will find rest. Rest that can only be found in him. Rest that can only be given by him. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for joining. God bless you. Bye-bye.